Welcome to the podcast. It's dedicated to making you a faster cyclist. The Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. I'm Coach Jonathan Lee. Uh, today, we are going to get into how to burn more calories. We're also going to talk about threshold workouts, crosswinds. It's going to be a good time. We have our head coach, Chad Simmer, and we also have Ventum Bikes, Ivy Audrain. Let's get into Tim's question right off the bat. Tim says, hey, all, I'd first like to thank Ivy for hyping workout alternates so much. Well done, Ivy. Uh, <laughs> it's a feature I've used a lot recently in the past. I use it only when I needed a shorter workout, but recently I've been doing it to use or been using it to do longer workouts with the hopes that by doing a workout that burns more kilojoules at the same progression level that I will perhaps see an improvement in body composition. This would not be the first time I've completely misunderstood an aspect of training. So I'm hoping <laughs> you can help me understand how, if at all, I'm helping myself by doing a longer workout when I have the time, assuming I'm feeling the work appropriately. Uh, one of the many things that I'm learning from the trainer road podcast crew. So thanks from Tim, a subscriber for life. Thanks Tim. Uh, if you're listening to this now and you want to be a subscriber for life, that would be amazing. Uh, you can go and sign up at trainerroad.com. It's how we keep this podcast going. And it's how we keep building awesome features like adaptive training, AI, FTP detection, and workout alternates to make you faster. Ivy, uh, what's yeah. to you about this whole decision of like using workout alternates to, uh, gets a bit more KJ burn, like same progression level. So the workout isn't theoretically yeah. harder, but you're right. just doing more work. <clears throat> and that's, what's cool about workout alternates. Everyone's gotta be so sick of hearing me talk about workout alternates, but I just think it's <laughs> the best feature. It's so great. Like if you want to, if you feel like you have more time on a day and you have the bandwidth to extend your workout by a little bit, and you still want to meet the same goals or on the other side, if you feel like you're time crunched and um, need to shorten your workout and you don't know how to do so while still meeting the system requirements that that workout would meet. So meeting requirement for a VO two max level, or, you know, a threshold goal, you can use a workout alternate to still meet those comprehensive goals in the scope of your plan while changing the duration. And those intervals might look different and the rest might look different, but you're still meeting the same goal and just changing the duration of the workout, which is really cool because a lot of times for people that are time crunched, that can be the difference between doing a workout and not, you know, mm -hmm. like how many athletes, when they don't realize they have the option to do the same work, but just in a shorter scope of time, um, would just skip a workout if they didn't feel like they had time, you know? So that's why I'm the biggest fan. Sorry. I'm never going to stop mm -hmm. talking about them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but apart from body comp goals, which are, which is a great goal. That's totally fine. More volume can o can only be a good thing can only help you long and short term in the scope of your fitness. As long as you're staying on top of fueling and recovery, um, that can be the downside to just being like, I can do more volume. I have more time. Sure. Anyone can, but if you're not staying on top of fueling recovering, then it'll be all for naught. It won't ultimately help you be faster. Um, hmm. but can, for Tim, can I talk really quick on the recovery part, really, yeah, uh, comment please. on that because um, I think it's misunderstood a lot of the time when people think that like, it's really just based on how much time I have to train and fill that up. But like right now, um, I, if I did anything more than a low volume plan, I would just, I would not even be able to continue like two weeks into training, like with just life right now, all of that I can absorb. And even then it's questionable if I'm even absorbing it with the low volume <laughs> plan, just because sleep is compromised. And because, you know, there's the, the workloads and family life and church and everything else are just so high. So because of all that, it's like, I, I can only absorb so much from it. So this is, uh, you made a very important stipulation there. It's how much you can fuel and then how much you can recover from. And right now I could fuel the work. Um, I might even have time to do more work if I really, you know, stretched my calendar but it doesn't matter because I can't absorb that work. And the way that I can tell that is just how I feel really fatigued and I, and I don't, my rate of improvement isn't even remotely close. Like I'm just not really improving. I'm <laughs> just like mm -hmm. stepping along lightly. Whereas typically I'm on this upward trajectory back up to, you know, 315 watt FTP and it feels great right now. That's a pipe dream. Like it's just not going to happen um, with the, and it's, I could dose my body with the same training that it's been dosed with before but life circumstances are such that I can't absorb that. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Like there's always a temptation to do more, right, Ivy? But it's yeah. not better if you can't feel it and if you can't recover from it. So I just want to reinforce that point. It was a really, really good point. Thanks. Yeah. And if you're an athlete that regularly does opt for a longer alternate and you feel like 
you can absorb it and it's sticking and you're doing it consistently, like more than a couple of days a week, you're choosing a longer alternate for a, for a structured workout. Um, you should probably up your plan volume. If you feel like you can maintain it and you've been maintaining it for a while and you can stay on top of fueling and recovery, if you're doing it consistently more than a couple of days a week, you should increase your plan volume. Um, but if you're doing that for like your endurance days, only just like a day a week, and you always feel like you're pushing it, that doesn't mean that you should necessarily change your plan volume or increase it. Um, so yeah, that's a really good point that thinking about how that training is absorbed is maybe more critical than choosing a volume that you can sustain, like considering how it can be really absorbed. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. There's, um, something I just want to mention on workout alternates. We had somebody writing that was a bit upset because they, and perhaps we did make this mistake, but it's also, it'd be really easy to make this mistake just in misunderstanding it because of the words that we use, but workout alternates isn't used to switch your threshold day to a different zone. Like you can't use, if you have a threshold or like a, we talk about this commonly with plans when you have like a sweet spot workout, that's like, you know, one to two hours on a Saturday in your training plan or something or a tempo workout and switching that over to an endurance workout, you wouldn't use workout alternates to do that. We've probably said, use it to find an alternate workout. And yeah, that's confusing <laughs> for us. <laughs> something you know, something that may add a bit more confusion to that is if you're using train now, that's mm -hmm. what I'm doing right now. So there isn't really a target energy system that's aligned with a plan. So you can switch and <laughs> I do it quite a lot. L lately, I'm just doing 30 minute workouts, trying to reestablish consistency and just trying to get my body used to being back on the bike. So I'm keeping them short. And I got to tell you, every time I, I hop on a train now, I cycle through those probably eight, 10 times looking for a workout that doesn't look <laughs> terrible. And, and it's credit to what we're doing here because adaptive training is so good. It, it's just every time I pick something that I think, ah, oh, that is not going to be easy. I don't know if I can do that even if it's just a 30 minute workout and sure enough, I can do it. And it's a struggle every time I'm so tired of checking the very hard <laughs> box at the end of all of my workouts. <laughs> That's where I'm at right now, but it, it does a great job. The alternates doesn't seem to matter what I choose, whether I go from sweet spot to anaerobic anywhere inside of that range, it gives me a workout yeah. that is just barely what I can handle on the day. And, and this is just in train now, not even within a plan. Yeah. And something that's pretty cool that you can do when you're, when you have that workout scheduled is you can change the duration and you can change the difficulty level when you're doing that. So like, let's just say that, uh, it's just a rough day in that case, you can drop it down to, instead of being a productive day, you could drop it down to being an achievable day. So you'll still do your threshold workout or your VO2 or whatever is scheduled for that day. It's just going to be a relatively easier one compared to what you've been doing recently. And that can really if you, help if your ego allows so. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's good exercise for the ego. And maybe, you know, you're feeling real extra spicy. You could always like ramp it up, but, yeah. um, in most cases, adaptive training is going to be taking care of that anyway for you. So it's going to be putting you where you need to be anyway for difficulty. So yeah, super helpful. I, I think it's probably a worth discussing just a broad discussion about burning more calories in general, Chad, like, mm -hmm. um, like number one, why you'd want to do it. Um, and how to like wrap your head around this concept of burning more calories as it relates to like the effort that you're doing and the work you're doing, all that stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's, so really what we're talking about is shifts in body composition, right? We're not looking to burn calories just for the sake of burning calories. We're looking to burn additional calories with the intent of altering our body composition favorably, right? We want to, and in most cases as endurance athletes, we're not looking to add any muscle. We're really just looking to shave off some, some extra adipose, some, some body fat. And it, it's, uh, certainly understandable. I, I get, you, you think, you know, more calories out will yield, you know, with the same caloric intake will yield a little bit less body fat. And that's true, but geez, you ha always have to keep in mind how difficult dieting is. And, and it's just, it, I, there are downsides to it and I don't want to complexify something or put the wrong ideas in people's heads, but it is difficult. And the body is super good at adapting to changes. We know this. So, you know, we, we, we do reductions in, in caloric intake or excesses in caloric expenditure with the intent of losing a little bit of weight. And honestly, we're, we're looking for a little bit of fat loss, but the body does things. And, and, and one of those things is it lowers our basal metabolic rate. And, and, and it kind of stacks the deck against us. Should we eventually exit that dietary modification? there that can set us up for kind of a 
a rebound effect where now we're working with a lower metabolic rate and base rate, and we're adding calories back into the mix because we learned that wasn't enough calories or it was enough calories to get us the, the fat loss we wanted. But now we're going off that plan, which means inevitably, unless we're upping our activity, and this is the point I'm getting at, it's, it's going to come back. So what I wanted to just open people's eyes to is that is what, what's widely agreed upon. And, and this was summed up really nicely in uh, an article by Eric Trexler the other day. And I'm just going to do a little snippet from one of his quotes that says total daily expenditure, energy expenditure definitely drops over the course of a su successful weight loss attempt. And that's kind of what we're describing here. And a substantial increase in physical activity seems to be a solid predictor of successful weight loss maintenance. And that's the point I want to make. That's kind of what Tim's talking about here. He's adding on a little bit of excess maintenance and it's not non-exercise activity. It is exercise activity, but it's done at the low end of the spectrum so that it almost veers into non-exercise territory, not really depleting resources, not really taking a heavy muscular toll, not really taking a high neurological toll, just tacking on a little bit of extra work to burn a few extra calories. So in that case, you almost don't really even need to reduce your caloric intake. You could maintain, just do a little extra work, see this gradual and drive that point home, gradual mm -hmm. alteration in body composition over time. So the, the, the point is, is once the weight's off, if you've increased your overall phys physical activity levels, like Tim's suggesting with extra work, you stand a way better chance of sustaining this, this body composition change long-term. I love this concept. Great points, Chad. Thank you um, for, for doing that. Um, I love this concept of enabling yourself to do more work and then letting body composition work itself out, mm -hmm. like and become what it is. And Tim, you're on the right path. You're not saying, I want to run a calorie deficit of this, blah, blah, blah. You are talking about burning more KJs, but really our effort should be, how do we enable our body to do more work? And if you do that, your body composition will become what it needs to be over time. It's like this gradual shift that it will do. But when you introduce these jarring changes, your body responds, it responds and it will introduce changes like dropping your basal metabolic rate when you deprive itself, um, because it's going to say, I'm not getting enough. So therefore I'm going to turn down the engine a little bit and Something's we're not going to burn so hot. Yep. And then if you're combining that with then saying, I want to do more work, it gets really complicated. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I took a backcountry ski ski trip up to Powder Creek Lodge uh, to podcast listeners that are listening to this right now, John and Shelly Peachel, they own the lodge. It's amazing. It's like the greatest experience ever. And it was like 37 hours of in a week of backcountry skiing, right? And low, super low aerobic sort of stuff, and but just awesome. And in that, we had uh, Paula Finley and Eric Lagerstrom, uh, professional triathletes. Paula got second at Ironman 70.3 World Championships last year. Uh, Eric Lagerstrom won 70.3 Santa Cruz and Alcatraz, lots of cool stuff. Anyways, really good athletes. And we were all talking about this concept of like losing weight because a big discussion point with a lot of people was calorie burn and how it's not effort. It's not how hard you try. It's all based on the amount of work you do. But anyways, this whole conversation developed out of this and the best athletes there, they all were saying that I have had the best body composition. I'm leaner when I quit counting my calories and I quit trying to deprive myself. And instead I focus on doing more work and fueling that work as much as possible. And that's when I reach the best body composition, but not only that, that's when I reach the best performance. That's when I feel the best off the bike and in general life, that's when all those great things happen. So I feel like Tim really awesome job on on going down the right avenue toward this body composition optimization. Um, optimal is variable. It will look like whatever it needs to look like based on the amount of work you're doing and based on what you're fueling your body and everything else. But the last thing you want to do is try to deprive yourself to reach that. Instead, how about ramping up that work rate like you're doing? Um, all this said, huge caveat here. This is a really easy way for a lot of athletes to put themselves in a hole, right? Ivy, we're like, you're like, yeah, I want to do more. I want to optimize body composition. And of course, more equals better in my brain. So therefore I should just do it. But most of us are already, we have really thin margins to play with in our lives in terms of what we're tolerating with our stress. So, you know, I'm sure you've seen this on the pod or on the forum and stuff over the years of just athletes running things too close to the sun. So, oh yeah. And especially after an off season or all of a sudden when the weather gets nice or when something changes in your life and you suddenly have a bunch of bandwidth to train more, um, and just to pile it on immediately and not make, not make changes in your nutrition and fueling to facilitate it. 
but also you can't just make a abrupt change like that. Like even for someone, for people like us that are well-trained, um, there's a reason Chad is just doing 30 minute train now workouts. Um, you can't just throw your body into that and make a huge change like that. And during Chad's shallow dive, all I could think about was in that scenario of doing a deficit like that and changing your basal metabolic rate and just like what that does to your wellness outside of the bike, like apart from body composition changes or just wanting to fuel the work, just taking that secondary approach of the deficit just is so traumatizing. I had like mm-hmm. horrible flashbacks. Like it's such a <laughs> horrible approach. It just feels awful. And it just feels so much better to just focus on the work and, and, oh my gosh, just like counting calories and thinking about where you could cut down here and there just feels so much worse than just yeah. focusing on the the work you're doing as an athlete. Yeah. And in almost every circumstance too, right? Like when you <clears throat> drop weight in that sort of fashion through calorie deficits and everything else, it's very easy to get to the point where your power just drops in lockstep with it, right? Like your ability to do work also drops because your body oh is- gosh bringing in and working with less energy. So it's, and it you can spiral, spiral. And you're just yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> or you're like, well, shoot my, my, uh, my weight drop, but my power to weight ratio is the same or worse. I better lose more weight. And then like, it's just, and really why am easy. I crying? And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, this reminds me it's, it's a, it harkens back to probably one of my most influential uh, mentors back in the day. You guys drink at the same time as freaky. Um, <laughs> that's, that's what you can a catch mirror you image. go on YouTube and watch us, by the way. <laughs> it's totally <laughs> distracting. Mean, it totally pulled me off my game right there. <laughs> uh, but, but he would prescribe body composition changes over multiple seasons. I don't think I ever saw one mm. prescribed in any less than two full seasons. That's two years. And I'm not talking one season of a particular discipline into another. This was when people were pretty regimented. They were road racers and that was it. And mm. and they would just, so, so two seasons meant two years of intentional gradual, slow body composition change. And it's occurring to me now that he might've actually been kind of burying the lead almost, or or trying to distract us from the fact of what we were actually doing by instead of having us focus on reductions in caloric intake and counting calories and quote dieting, he just had us do the work and, and fuel adequately. And it took care of itself because our work capacity went up, which just, just like you guys are describing the body follows suit, just like I've described many times we adapt and it was a far more healthful approach to it. And I think he kind of snuck it under the radar because none of us really (laughs) recognized it for what it was. (laughs) Yeah. It's a good approach. And honestly, um, I remember this is, uh, the, for my mentor, when I had started cycling, I remember talking to him and about this and we were riding with somebody who was super fit. And I remember like commenting to him, I was new at cycling. I was like, he has like, I didn't know that you had veins all over your legs like that. I didn't know it was like physically possible for humans to have that sort of thing. And and he was like, yeah, he's like, his body just looks like that. Cause that's what it needs to look like. You know, <laughs> he's been, he's been training it like that for a while. And that's just what he looks like. But what you look like will be something different. And what I look like is something different. And I really enjoyed that perspective um, uh, from Roger. He's a great guy. So and I think that that's like a um, something that we can all realize is that performance is what's what really matters. And for us cyclists, we all look entirely different. And if we're chasing a look, uh, we might be able to achieve that look, but that certainly does not coincide with performance. Performance is something totally different. And performance comes from proper nourishment and then progressive overload managed correctly, right? with work over time. It, it's not a night to the, it's not a one day to the next thing. It takes a long time. So, so hopefully that gives folks some, some insight into <clears throat> some calorie burning and everything else. That's a really common thing, particularly like this time of year, athletes are moving out of the base phase and uh, they commonly pair that up with weight loss goals and they have races coming up and it's like a big focus. So fuel the work and train yourself to do more work. It's probably a better way to do it. Uh, this next question is super interesting, Chad. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, there's another thing too from the chat. Ivy, I don't know if you added that in. Um, is there something you want to cover? That was Maxine. Oh, Maxine. Sorry. Um, let our, me... edit, our, our superstar editor, Maxine, crushing <laughs> it in the live chat. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Maxine. Um, oh, so this is a good question about train now. So they say, 
they know that there are changes coming to adaptive training uh, that will factor in your non-trainer road rides uh, where we've uh, previously kind of been sharing like a working name with you all of workout levels v2 but um adaptive training 2.0 is really probably the best way to describe this uh, it's going to be quite exciting um but the question is they, they know that that's coming but then the question does train now factor this in when recommending uh workouts and I don't want to go too much into the details here because we have secret sauce that I don't want to uh, divulge, <laughs> but yes, it does look at your outdoor rides, uh, specific criteria of those outdoor rides. And as a result, if you've done something hard recently, then like, like with Chad taking a day off or so, uh, in between his workouts, he's probably not seeing this, but if Chad had done, um, a train now climbing, uh, workout, and or an attacking workout the next day, it's not going to recommend that based on what they've done. Or com conversely, if Chad went out and did a big old big ride uh, the day before, big gravel ride, stretched his limits in that sort of context, it's also not going to recommend that they do something hard. But that's uh, that's just a basic uh, thing of what Train Now will do. So that's probably why you're seeing that in that case. The secret sauce is just Chad manually <laughs> in a dark basement with 35 computer monitors <laughs> checking everybody's workouts busy man <laughs> busy man we'll do. ai over, is uh, smarter than all of us together <laughs> yeah oh, what is it uh, we're getting close to over 190 million activities uh, in our database right now so chad's really busy i don't know how he does it all <laughs> um, yeah yeah really thanks guy. for being the hamster on the wheel chad Appreciate you. um <laughs> Uh, Ian says, Hey, all I started, and this one's super interesting. I'm really glad you wrote this in. If you have questions uh, that you'd like to write in and ask us, go to trainerroad.com slash podcast, please. That would be awesome. This is how we get all the questions every week. And you've done this for six years, over six years now. Amazing. So keep doing it. Uh, it's pretty great. Ian says, I started listening to the podcast in the past few months, and I've really been enjoying it. Kudos on the heavy re reference to peer-reviewed info. And for a really fun dynamic between all the hosts, I'm not a trainer road user currently, but I'm sure you will all convert me uh, soon enough with all the excellent content you're putting out. I would love to do that, Ian. Uh, whenever you're ready, we're ready for you. So uh, Ian says about me, I am a tall, mentions six foot four inches. Uh, can somebody look that up in centimeters? I should have put that down first. But yeah. six, four, six foot four inches cross-country marathon and gravel racer that lives at high-ish altitude at 6,000 feet. We should probably convert that too, but I think that that's probably somewhere around like 1,700 meters. 1,800, a little over 1,800. And that's pretty 100, close. 193 centimeters. Cool. So right. tall athlete and living at altitude. Thanks, uh, y'all. Crack team here. Um, I'm fairly highly trained with an FTP maximum around five watts per kilogram. Yeah, that's solid. And just got done with a heavy racing season working with a coach. In my few races closer to sea level last year, I noticed a massive power increase of 10 to 15% and was able to set some epic, uh, for me, power numbers. I've also noticed feeling an impact from beetroot powder more than some of my other smaller in stature, in stature riding partners when training at home. And that 10 to 15% increase is more than what you would typically expect going from that elevation down to sea level. Um, so that's why they're referencing that. So the question is, is it possible that elevation has a larger impact on taller cyclists? And if so, is it possible that things that improve oxygen carrying capability, like beetroot powder, for example, uh, hint, hint for something Ivy's working on right now, uh, can also have an increased impact on taller cyclists or like so many other things, is this all just in my head? Uh, thanks and keep up the great work from Ian. It's a good question, Chad. Uh, I think that we've kind of posited different uh, guesses, not theories, but guesses mm -hmm. about like, you know, taller riders having more muscle mass just because of the length of their muscles at the very least and, and how that could change things or something else. Or maybe they have bigger lungs. Who knows? We've, we've talked about yeah. like kind of theorize on a few different uh, topics like this, but I've never directly thought about whether taller riders are affected more adversely as altitude goes up. What do you, what, I don't know what you were able to look into on this one. Yeah. And I did look into it and I've got a, a short answer and a slightly longer answer, but the short answer is no, at least nothing that I found in the literature or nothing that I can string together with my admittedly still growing understanding of human physiology, but nothing really computes. Um, bigger muscles just mean greater work capacity, just mean higher oxygen demand. It, they're relative to the power you can put out and it's just nothing, nothing makes sense to me. It doesn't mean there, that there isn't a correlation, but there wasn't anything I could find. Um, my longer answer is that anything that improves aerobic capacity or VO2 max or 
really simply just your aerobic metabolism or conversely, anything that mitigates reductions in your aerobic capabilities, like a reduction in oxygen partial pressure at elevation, for instance, it's only going to be more evident in bigger VO2 maxes if the VO2 max is viewed absolutely, right? If we're looking at four liters, five liters, five, five, six liters, whatever, absolute values that aren't couched against any other measure or other value. But performance is tied to relative VO2 max. So we're always, you know, looking at how much oxygen is consumed per minute, per kilogram of body weight. So, you know, per, per pound, whatever it may be. Point here is that, that bigger riders probably find any advantages at different elevations elsewhere. So I don't mm -hmm. think there's some, some, some advantage outside of obvious things. And, and those include course characteristics. I mean, is this a flat course when, when you're a big, powerful rider who can lay down big Watts and you get a 10% bump in your capabilities and that 10% really makes a big difference. You know, you're, are, are you playing these courses to your particular strengths, uh, intensity levels, which really, I guess we could frame more in, in, in the, in the, put it in the frame of pacing. You know, are you, are you pacing? Well, nutrition is always a factor. Uh, hydration, uh, less so at low elevation than high elevation. Uh, and then uh, the, the benefits of acclimat accl acclimation and acclimatization. I mean, Ian lives at 6,000 feet, as we just described as about as a little over 1800 meters. So his levels of NO2 or, or nitrites, and that's a bit of a teaser may already be elevated. So, so most of this is just not very revelatory. You know, there's just not a heck of a lot of meat on this bone. Far more interestingly, and something that's actually really easily accessible, beet juice. And, and, and kind of a cool thing here, I didn't realize that Ivy had in the pipe what she has in the pipe. So we're <laughs> going to kind of tag team deep dive this, which is super cool because you should never dive alone. That's that's a real thing, right? Oh, oh. Good <laughs> Scuba Cute. certified chat over here. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Okay. So I, I would like to be the first to admit that this is new territory for me. I have experimented with beet juice in the past, but I didn't have a real full grasp on what exactly I was after. Um, I do think I was dosing it and timing it. I mean, I was doing what the label set and, and that probably was the right way to go about it. And I'm going to find out because I'm going to re up my uh, supply of beet juice and I'm going to do a longer term thing. And I'll explain why. I'm going to when make a longer label, term. Sorry, Chad, but when you say label, you're talking mm -hmm. about not juicing the beets themselves, but instead using a product that is yeah. in some way, whether it's crystals. capsules or, okay. In this case, it. It is, is a concentrate crystals. Well, not even concentrates, it's crystals, which is a concentrated form, but I think concentrate implies- It's like dehydrated anyway. or something, right? Yep. Or, yep. Yeah. I'm going to leave the concentrate to Ivy because I saw she had some notes on that. Um, cool. So <laughs> I'm going to lean on and all this is pretty recent. So that, that's, that's fun because a lot of science on this or a lot of, yeah, a lot of science, a lot of research in recent years has surfaced last 10 years, last five, especially I'm going to look at a 2017 systematic review coupled with a 2021 narrative review. And then I know Ivy's got something that's right in the middle there, a 2020 systematic review. So question is, is why would something like beetroot juice, uh, beet powder, concentrate crystals, whatever, improve your oxygen consumption capacity, your oxygen uptake capacity. And it should be stated just this, the, from, from the, from the jump that the Australian Institute of Sport, Louisburg, the international Olympic committee, all categorize beet juice as a supplement that's surrounded by quotes, high level of evidence. So, and at least with it, huh. its regards to effects on performance, and this is placed alongside tried and true ergogenic supplements. Others like, uh, caffeine, creatine, uh, beta alanine, sodium bicarbonate and others. But, but again, you know, the question remains, why would beet juice improve our aerobic capabilities? And I wanted to talk about this mostly to illuminate the other positive effects the the lesser known positive effects of inorganic nitrates. And I point out inorganic nitrates because I know Ivy has a point on inorganic versus organic, which I'll leave to her, but to, to a quick review, we ingest nitrates, right? It's NO3 in our mouth. And then we have anaerobic bacteria in our mouth that converts the nitrates to nitrite. So now our NO3 goes to NO2. And then in the stomach or uh, geez, the lower intestine, somewhere in the lower GI tract, the NO2 is converted to NO. So now we're working with nitric oxide and this is when it's in the bloodstream and in the muscles. And this is where all the related benefits take place. Amongst those benefits is the, you know, the most, perhaps the most celebrated, at least the most publicized, which is vasodilation. And, and rightly so, because anytime we get bigger blood vessels in athletes who require tremendously high oxygen and nutrient delivery to the muscles, you know, it's, it's a good thing. I mean, this alone provides reason 
for pursuing this particular marginal gain. And uh, it is what it is. Uh, regulation of blood flow and oxygen consumption. So, so our volume of oxygen consumed, uh, beetroot juice can reduce that consumption, especially relevant to endurance athletes at moderate to high intensities. So the translation here is that increases in exercise economy happen. So less oxygen is used for the same power output. And it, it's a lot of information to process. This is likely due to increase in mitochondrial efficiency, but it may be due to some muscle fu function action that we'll get to a little later on. And for what it's worth, these benefits don't always translate at altitude. And I know we're talking about low altitude here, but if you go to high altitude, the studies of the nitric oxide benefit at altitude are pretty controversial. There's, there's quite hmm. a bit of contradictory data there. Why would that be? Is that just because, <laughs> it, you know, uh, thinking about it, we have vasodilation going on. We're kind of like opening up a gate, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're opening up a gate, but there's just less oxygen on board mm -hmm. because of the fact that you're up at elevation, is perhaps that the reason why it's not as effective at elevation? Yeah. I mean, there's only so much air. So regardless of how much, how great the blood flow is, if you were already pulling all you get out of the partial, the lower partial pressure, then mm -hmm. why would bigger, uh, greater levels yeah. of dilation lead to, I maybe that's it. I don't know. I'm wondering if that's the reason IV why I'm like so skeptical on beets and beetroot juice, like because of my individual yeah. experimentation, I found zero noticeable benefit whatsoever. But I'm also like my average training elevation. If you look at it on like, you know, Garmin connect or anything like that, whatever my watch always tells me, it's like my average training elevation is like six to 7,000 feet, somewhere within that range, depending on the season of the year. So, well, we, I think both of us have a little bit, some ideas on why that may be. Uh, huh, cool. So it just as for it, the, the, let's talk the more muscle specific benefits of nitrates. Um, first off, mitochondrial respiration. It's just more blood flow to the mitochondria. And this is just going to lead to more aerobic work capacity. It's probably not quite that simple, but that's at least part of it. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean improved economy in this case though, because the oxygen cost can and often does still remain the same. But if more oxygen is getting utilized, this leads to greater times to exhaustion, which is hugely important for endurance athletes. And the simple answer there is it's just less anaerobic burden. I mean, we're, we're blowing through our glycogen stores at a lower rate because we're metabolizing more fuel aerobically. Should mention that the time to exhaustion improvements typically follow longer supplementation bouts. So you can't just, you know, hit the, have a, have a scoop of beet powder and then go out and magically last longer. This typically uh, is on the heels of changes that take a little more time to, to occur, but a, a cool finding, something that's very encouraging and, and has motivated why I'm going to do what I'm going to do is that studies have sustained some effects up to 15 days. The point being is that chronic use can actually yield chronic ergogenic you know, performance enhancing effects. So I'm going to give that a shot and see if that's the case. And then while on the topic of chronic usage, uh, mito mitochondrial biogenesis, so it's a term we fling around a lot, basically just more mitochondria and clearly anything that requires longer supplement, anything that's going to be that big of an adaptation physiologically is going to require longer supplementation protocol. So this would be another one that's going to take a bit of time. But the point is, if we can increase our mitochondrial proliferation, it's a win. And it really doesn't matter if you're an elite endurance athlete or a couch potato. It's just, it's just a healthier you. Uh -huh. uh, mitochondria aside, increased glucose uptake in the muscle. And this is, you know, once again, especially germane to endurance athletes. I suspect that this just ties back to better blood delivery. I didn't dig, in, dig into the mechanism here, but eh, that, 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 that makes sense to me. And then finally, uh, the muscle contraction relaxation thing that I, that I just mentioned, this can be improved and it has to do with how the calcium modulation impacts actin and myosin cross bridging, blah, 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 science, science, science. The point is <laughs> these beneficial effects have been seen with both acute and chronic supplementation. So whether you use it short-term or long-term and in predominantly aerobic athletes, as well as predominantly anaerobic athletes. So good news for all types of athletes, potentially. And then uh, there's even a small amount of evidence that suggests that improved, that, that yields improved muscle endurance. So number of reps in the gym. And according to one study, this seemed to only affect the type two fibers, which, you know, if they're, if that's accurate, it lends further support to a possibility, the possibility that benefits exist for more than just endurance athletes. And then uh, just a couple honorable mentions in terms of benefits, reduce cardiac strain and reduce blood pressure. I mean, if the vessels are bigger, that's less work for the heart. Uh, that's going to lower blood pressure. That's a potential boon 
and then improved nervous function due to influences on certain neurotransmitters, serotonin being one of them, serotonin being tied to fatigue, and then improved neuromuscular performance, you know, which could be translated to just coordination. And it's loaded with antioxidants. So carotenoids, uh, ascorbic acid, vitamin C, phenolic acid, flavonoids, meaning just high antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties, which is all good stuff. Okay, so hmm. any of that, do you want to chime in on IV before I get to timing and dosage? Um, No, not yet. <laughs> okay, didn't mean to dump that in your lap right there. No, that's all right. Trample you. <laughs> okay, so timing and dosages, and I'll keep this brief, but I'm painting a pretty rosy picture here, so I'd like to provide something a bit actionable. Um, first thing to keep in mind is that blood concentration typically takes about two to three hours from ingestion. So the... And then in hand in hand in hand with that, the ergogenic effects are observed at right about you know mid midpoint. There's so two and a half hours post ingestion. So basically, time your intake accordingly. The dosages and IV is going to shed some different light on this, which is appreciated. Uh, the studies I looked at saw effects using doses ranging anywhere from seventy milliliters, and I think that was on the concentrate. But typically, they were three hundred to five hundred fifty milliliters of beet juice. And I think that's just, you know, well, it was, it's just the, the juice itself. So actual, you know, juiced beets. And at the high end, this took place five times a day. So reading that, it led me to believe that it's at least difficult to overdose on beet juice. As far as how this translates to concentrates and powders, um, one example, the stuff I use, Beet Elite, is concentrated beet crystals. And the, the the directions is two tiny scoops, which equates to 10 grams in about four to six ounces of water. And you do it 20 to, thri uh, 20 to 30 minutes prior, which suggests to me that this is a more bioavailable form of beets. Makes sense too. And it clearly states, do not exceed 10 grams in 24 hours, which has me thinking now, well, maybe you can in fact overdose when it's in a concentrated manner. I don't know. And it bears mentioning that you should avoid mouthwash because remember those anaerobic bacteria that I mentioned earlier that convert the nitrate to nitrite. Well, don't kill them before they can do that job. And then- I'll close with just a, a brief mention of responders and non-responders, which is, you know, because Jonathan brought it up, but it's going to go that way. Some people are going to swear by it. Some people are going to swear it does nothing for them. But the purported effects of beetroot supplementation can be altered and affected by a number of things amongst them, age, diet, your physiological state. So just your general health, your training status. Um, and then of course, the intensity, the duration, even the modality of the endurance exercise in which you're engaging and even environmental conditions. Uh, I mentioned altitude earlier. So, and then uh, even your level adaptation to something like altitude could alter your response. So really simply results do may vary. And all of those Ivy. reasons are why Ian shouldn't compare success of beetroot supplementation to their training buddy, you know, mm -hmm. um, cause it goes so much farther beyond stature and in all those studies how well trained the athletes are in terms of the level of their competition and things like their measured vo2 max had to do with how much how how like much beetroot juice you needed um how chronically you needed to ingest it the um amount of nitrates like all of those things um so the reason why ian might feel like uh, beetroot supplementation is working better for them than their buddy could be due to a number of things like the source of the beetroot juice. Um, Ian could be, you know, juicing beets or getting a, a like raw form of beet juice where their training buddy might be using something inorganic, like, um, like a pill form or something that's not actually derived completely from beets, some other sort of nitrate source that isn't ultimately as effective and from an aerobic capacity. There might be other health benefits that you were mentioning that still come from inorganic sources of nitrates, but from a performance standpoint, coming from beets, beetroots themselves is the most effective. So you don't know the source of beetroot mm -hmm. juice or nitrates that your training buddy is getting. You don't know if they're doing the bioactivation of the nitrates by using the bacteria in their mouth. Um, you know, Ian might do a pretty good job of and it's so weird. You don't have to like swish it around like mouthwash, but you do need to acknowledge that the bacteria in your mouth is an important part of the bioactivation of those nitrates. And if you just toss it down the hatch because you hate it and it's disgusting and try to just get it over with, or if you're taking 
you know, nitrate pills, you're not going to get the same effect. So, um, another reason why it's hard to compare, you don't know exactly what your training buddies are doing. And then finally, you don't know how much nitrates they're really getting, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it's so like an untrained person would need, like Chad was mentioning those 70 milliliter shots. Um, you get three to 500 milligrams of nitrates in those. And for a untrained or lower level competition person, that might be enough. But for someone like Ian, who seems very well-trained, um, you need to ingest over a thousand milligrams of nitrates in order to see measurable performance benefits. John, should I say how many beats that is too? <laughs> no, save it for the video. I want to tease okay. it. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we've, uh, we don't want to, it's a good video and it's fantastic. I, we did a lot of research and that's coming up. Um, stay yeah, tuned. If you see me less, if you see me less on the forum, it's because, uh, I'm doing more, uh, content stuff now for trainer road talking about beats and, and ways to get faster. And you can still message me on the forum. If you, you know, if you really want to talk about adaptive training, I'll still be there. I'll do it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in the meantime, I get to yeah learn about beetroot juice anyway. So all of those reasons are, you know, completely relevant in, in not making comparisons of, oh, beet juice mm. worked for this person. That means it should work for me. There's so many variables that, that contribute to its success as a supplement, um, that have to be considered. Um, it doesn't work for everyone. Couldn't, couldn't be me like the yeah. cost and the, or the labor intensive factor of drinking that much beet juice chronically. Also, I hate it. Like it's horrible. Yeah. So, yes. Chad, you're better than me. <laughs> no, no. That, I, I suspect the beet elite stuff that I'm taking is probably loaded with sugar. I should probably look closer at the label because it tastes really good. Although admittedly, I, I love beets. I absolutely love beets. Not to the point though, where I could juice and drink a ton of them in a day though. So this realistically, this is the only way I'm going to achieve any benefit from beets is via something that's convenient, quick, reasonably cheap, not, not, not terribly cheap, but affordable. Yeah. I, um, so this is a great example of a logic leap and I exemplified a logic leap and it's quite dangerous to do that, but I exemplified it when I was like, could that happen because of vasodilation and less oxygen being there? And just, it's great to think through things practically like that, but we also, I've made so many, uh, you know, I've, I've made these logic leaps and in doing so I've also uh, operated on an assumption and misunderstood something entirely because science and how our bodies work is quite complex. Right. Um, so many times when we make some sort of an assumption, that's why research is very important because it tests a lot of those assumptions that everything relies upon. And then we figure it out. And in this case, Ian, kind of like the assumption, it makes a lot of logical sense to be like, if elevation impacts me more because I'm a taller athlete, which is an assumption in and of itself, then perhaps beats also are going to have like, you know, an outsized effect based on body size. And, and that's once again, like, you know, a logic leap for sure. But it, well, it wasn't a logic leap. I mean, be, be fair to yeah. yourself. You were just positing a, a thesis. You're suggesting something, asking a question. I mean, this is how science evolves yeah. works. So it's, it's, we are scientists. It, yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> you didn't say, here's yeah. the answer, everyone. Here's what's happening. You asked, <laughs> could this be? Which yeah, and, and that's important to note is that I don't believe what I what I said is like the actual result, right? And Ian doesn't say that this is the case. Ian's asking questions as well. But it's always really important that we ask the questions, but then we don't formulate our own answer and then just run with it. Instead, that answer that we find, we should look to research. And, <clears throat> and here's the big thing is that we don't have all the answers um, in terms of what scientific research exists out there. Number one, there's a limited amount of researchers, a limited amount of time and subjects. Some things are really hard to test and some things we just have not fit yet figured out. It's complicated. So some things are really hard to prove, surprisingly so. Um, but uh, that's why the video that Ivy's working on, I feel like is a, a fantastic uh, resource. And stay tuned to our YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com slash trainer road. If you haven't subscribed yet, you're missing out. You'll get great video content from us. Um, between Ivy, Sarah, and I, we have some great stuff coming down the pipe. It's exciting. So uh, great question though, Ian. I do think that with bigger riders, one thing that has been established is that sweat rates on average, I mean, it's very much individually variable, but the greater surface area and everything else, they typically do end up sweating more volume. Um, that has nothing to do with your the actual sodium loss. That's a different uh, thing. And that's very much individual, but you do sweat more. So there are certain things. Absolutely. You do put out more power. Typically you weigh more, have bigger muscles and everything else. So you're able to do that, but, um, maybe not altitude. 
So uh, interesting. Thanks for looking into that, Chad. Uh, good stuff. Okay. Uh, this is, this one's from Stuart. I'm going to truncate this one a little bit here. Uh, and Ivy, this one's down your, uh, down your Avenue here. Why would the pending adaptation? So this is uh Stuart asking about adaptive training. Um, why would the pending adaptations over the next three weeks want to decrease my training, my training stress and intensity factor? And what they're talking about is they log into train a road. And then it says, every time you go to your calendar, it will say checking for adaptations. And when it runs that check, then after that, it will either say no adaptations needed, or it says uh, adaptations pending. And then you click them and you get to view the changes that uh, adaptive training is suggesting to your plan. Super cool. That's literally how easy it is to use trainer road <laughs> or and to use adaptive training. You just open it up and it does it for you. Um, in this case, Stuart says that over the next three weeks, training stress and intensity factor are dropping. Um, I'm six weeks into my custom plan. Yesterday, I completed a ramp test and started the second phase of the plan, and my FTP increased from 234 to 246. Well done. Way to go. Um, and then says, so why would the pending adaptations over the next three weeks want to increase tra training stress and intent or decrease, decrease the training stress and intensity factor? Uh, Stuart goes on to express like a lot of concern. He's like, this can't happen. Like, <laughs> like, like, don't rob me of training stress and intensity factor. I feel like in this case, Ivy, like, TSS and IF, we've talked about this a lot, right? They're not good ways to measure overall, like your training. Uh, it's not a precise way to go about it. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say in this case as to why this is probably happening? And maybe <clears throat> uh, give some comfort to Stuart in this case that uh, to not worry about it. I mean, nor is it a good perspective to believe that your training should always be difficult, um, which is not mm -hmm. uncommon. Um, it's okay that Stuart feels this way. Many athletes do, but it's not a good perspective long-term for getting faster to just believe that your training sh should always be pushing you forward. Everything should be challenging. You should always be increasing difficulty. Like that will lead to a really quick plateau. Um, that's not the way that training should be designed. Um, but athletes panic when they see uh, a rest week or see training being scaled back or easier at a glance, um, they panic and it's okay. Um, that happens to our training sometimes. And with adaptive training, there are a number of reasons why that can happen. So first and foremost, workout proximity. So when you add your plan uh, via plan builder to your calendar, trainer is assigning a training plan based upon your experience level, the duration of time you have to train, um, your discipline, your key events, any plan time off. It's considering all of those things and building out this huge scope of workouts that go way, way, way into the future without fully understanding yet how your fitness is going to change. So of course, as you move through your training plan, as your fitness changes, um, as all these things that I'm about to mention happens, you will see changes in your training plan. So, um, I guess the alternate to that would be like, you don't get to see your training plan for the next six months <laughs> well, or a year. We could just do that, yeah. but you or know. <laughs> we change, or we change every single workout in the future, every single day, right? Like we yeah. put like a gate on that. So then that way you aren't overwhelmed <laughs> by the fact that like, you know, your workout that you're going to do in 364 days has changed 364 yeah. times by the time you get to it. It looks at what's coming up close. That's what you mean by like, like that workout proximity, right? Ivy. Exactly. And it would, we, you know, no training plan would ever serve you well to look at the future and look at your, your events and discipline and what you're doing a year out for your goal and be like, okay, this is exactly what you should do the whole year out. And you shouldn't deviate from that. Yeah, that wouldn't be serving you best. So workout proximity is a reason why your workouts would change, why you would receive an adaptations along with an FTP increase, um, or a progression level increase could result in changes in your workouts in the future. Um, your post-workout surveys, um, when you answer, so like, I, I wish I had Stuart's, uh, trainer account info so I could see what their <laughs> post-workout surveys were like, because if Stuart said that those workouts they were doing were, um, difficult, um, not even just very hard, like incompletable, but like, even if it's like slightly difficult, you will receive an adaptation likely that makes sure that your training and your goals stay achievable. Um, not everything is meant to totally kick your butt every time. So mm -hmm. your 
post-workout surveys influence how your workouts are adapted in the future. Um, if you miss a workout, you'll get to receive an adaptation. Um, you want to be eased back into training. Um, if you're sick or injured or take planned time off for vacation, the same goes for that. You might receive an adaptation that kind of scales you back, um, because you need to be eased back into training. Um, and then, you know, energy system decay. So if you do miss workouts or have time off and you haven't done by energy system, we mean like threshold is energy system. VO2 max is the energy system. If you haven't done a workout in that area for a certain amount of time within trainer road, your progression level will decrease. And we're not going to give you the same hard VO2 max workout that we originally scheduled. If you have missed VO2 workouts in that area for the past, you know, duration of time, we're going to give you achievable workouts. And sometimes that looks like scaling it back. Um, so Stuart, I know it's stressful that you feel like you're getting faster, but adaptive training is scaling you back, but it's for a reason. And it's done intentionally to make sure that long-term and short-term you can keep getting faster. Yeah. And there's, uh, is in terms of how we handle each of those situations, again, that's secret sauce. We don't, we, we don't plan to share that, but, uh, yeah, it's chat. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, but there's lots of additional options that will cause those adaptations to happen in the future. So the reason Stuart in this case is that the reason that your TSS and IF are probably going down is because you had an FTP increase. And as a result of the FP FTP increase, we're going to drop you down to more appropriate workouts, but keep in mind that your TSS, once your FTP changes, it's irrelevant to what your TSS was, relatively speaking, it's irrelevant to what it was before because TSS is dependent on your FTP, right? So if it's dependent on your FTP and your FTP has changed, uh, whatever 100 TSS was last week, it doesn't matter. It's not what, what 100 TSS is this week. So keep that in mind. Uh, that's why. So really, for all athletes in general, uh, if you obsess over TSS, what happens is that you typically end up driving yourself into a spot where you're doing more work than is required to receive the gains that you need. And then it's also more work than what's required based on the periodization needs, right? Chad, like if you're just ramping TSS up constantly and it's like, all right, every week I need to have this percent increase. And then you get to your goal event. You're not going to make it to that goal event with that sort of, uh, with that sort of ability to even be able to ride at your goal event because you'll be completely cooked. Like the goal isn't to reach a certain amount uh, amount of TSS. Instead, the goal is to really get the right workout at the right time that stresses the sort of work and the sort of zone that you're going to use on race day. So to do it incrementally. So anyways, no worries, Stuart. Don't worry about the TSS and IF. Uh, it's all okay. Um, Cameron's question says watching the women's cyclocross season, I've noticed a few women choosing to use a gel about 25 minutes into a 50 minute race. In your opinions, is this necessary? Is there a benefit for them to take on additional carbs in such a short race? And shouldn't these racers be able to preload the carbs needed for a 50 minute effort? Is there a placebo effect that makes all of this worth it? Fantastic questions, Cameron. Uh, Ivy, this is your zone again, <laughs> cyclocross. <laughs> uh, what, what say you, do, is this something you do? Uh, no, this would stress me out so much. Um, because, <laughs> <laughs> because I mean, it's totally course dependent. Um, sometimes there is like a really long, uh, straightaway section where you feel like you can probably count on being able to take a gel or something, but what if you're battling with someone and they don't let you come off the gas in that section, you know, like cycle cross is just so unpredictable. I would, it would stress me out so much to try to plan on, okay, at this moment in the race, I'm going to be able to take a gel and I'm going to need it. And I like depend upon it. Um, mm. so everyone's different and I, you know, maybe it's a placebo. Um, those final laps of a cross race are so demanding. I'm sure that it's helping them, but I do think, you know, Cameron's asking about, you know, carbs in this instance. And I don't think that these racers doing that are taking a gel halfway through a cross race or doing it for carbs. I think it's more about sugar or a caffeine for the final laps, um, of those cross races. Um, but in terms of carbs, I don't feel like I could catch up on carbs in the middle of a race like that. Um, the fueling for me starts, um, more than just the day of, or morning of a race It happens in the days leading up to it. So Cameron's right that a preload of carbs is far more important for a 50 minute race than trying to ingest carbs in the middle of a 50 minute race. But like I said, I think for those racers 
it's probably more about sugar or caffeine. Mm. Yeah. Good points. Chad, uh, what say you about the question when he says, is there a benefit for them to take on additional carbs in such a short race? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. So kind of, uh, how long it takes for sugar to be digested, metabolized, right. make it to the muscles actually be useful. Um, and, and this is, it's a fun observation and the commentators are super keen on this. They, they, they talk about it all the time. It's, it's gotten to the point where it's a little bit boring and they <laughs> seldom point out. And I asked, I pose this question to you guys, how many of them actually take that gel? Cause I've seen it in their leg bands and just like Ivy expounded on, or she, you can't, a lot of the time there's no opportunity to eat it. I mean, you can't even take a swig out of your bottle, let alone open a gel, eat the whole gel, somehow get it in you while your, your, your heart rate's red, redlining and, and you're just, I mean, you have too many things on your plate as it is already. So I see so many of these and I've really only noticed it in the female ranks come to think of it. Uh, but I see so many of them finish the race with that same gel tucked in the, the, band of their uh, chamois or their, their leg band. So I'm not even sure half of them are eating them, but, uh, the, so, so as far as how long it takes for the sugar to get into the muscles themselves, I mean, man, if you consult the, the blogosphere, if you make that mistake, you, you'll see three to 15 <laughs> minutes, three to 15 minutes. And, and, and I think one person wrote it and everyone else just looks it up real quick and then tax three to 15 minutes on it. Everyone's different. Right. And that's, that is accurate. Everyone's different. But if you actually look at the literature, literature seems to say it's more like 20 to 60 minutes. Mm-hmm. So in, in this, that's a big range, right? 20 up to an hour. A three X range. <laughs> yeah. And a big you know, range like that. I mean, that's a yeah. lot of time, 20 minutes versus an hour. And now we're not talking like three minutes versus nine. This is, this is a big range and it depends on a whole number of factors. And again, there's a lot of obvious things here. First is your diet. And consequently, your enzymatic makeup, right? I mean, are you a low carb, high fat proponent? Are you high carb? I mean, different rates of carbohydrate absorption, thanks to whatever's in your gut and whatever your gut's been conditioned to is a real effect of your diet. Is it ingested with or without water? I mean, all these people, I don't see bottles on, on their on their bikes. I know they can take a feed when they take a new bike, but man, I don't, I don't see bottles hardly ever. So this implies that they're taking it dry, which is definitely going to slow absorption, uh, digestion, and then absorption. What's the intensity you're working out? Uh, CrossFit race or CrossFit cyclocross races are basically, high the same in, <laughs> basically <laughs> they're high intensity affairs. <laughs> <laughs> they're high intensity affairs. So, so your, your system resources are tied up, right? I mean, you've got cooling, you've got work. I mean, digestion is really low on the list of things your body is concerning itself with right now. Um, what's the composition of the gel? Is there any protein in it? Is there any fat in it? Likely there is caffeine in it. Should you actually get to it? Uh, wh- what are the sugars themselves? I mean, all of these things can impact the rate of absorption. So, so the point I'm trying to make is it's, it's going to be highly specific to the athlete and the situation, the athlete in the situation. It's going to be difficult to predict without uh, pretty specific experimentation what the outcome is going to be, but more likely with these high level athletes and their deep understanding of what their bodies are capable of, they're oftentimes very strong coaching staffs and nutrition support. Um, they know that for a short event like this, there's no direct benefit outside of a couple of things that I'll talk about here briefly. First, the, just the mere presence of carbohydrate or really sugar on the tongue or, or in the mouth can have an ergogenic effect can have a performance enhancing effect. Just Google mouth rinsing carbohydrate solutions, and you'll see a a whole lot of information and a whole lot of experiments well-constructed carried out by the look of it. Well, well well-performed experiments. Um, these mouth mouth rinsing experiments repeatedly demonstrate performance improvements, and they're often pegged in the two to 3% range, which is not nothing, especially at a high level of competition. Mm Mm-hmm. And often, maybe always, I don't know, it, it's attributable to a central or an executive functioning effect. Okay. So, so it's more about the brain than your metabolism, than your muscles. It can have a, a positive effect in that it reduces our RPE. There's some muscle inhibitory actions that seem to kind of loosen their reins, uh, decline in executive function or cognitive capabilities are attenuated, attenuated or reduced. I mean, just the fact that you can think a little bit sharper, be a little more present, the, these are beneficial effects. And to the point where I almost wonder if just having that thing 
tucked in the the, the leg band has mm -hmm. somewhat of a placebo effect. Just knowing it's there, just the reassurance of I can get that extra little psychological boost if I take that gel. I mean, even that probably has uh, just the tiniest bit, but a, a measurable amount of value. Yeah. And that's, that's the only thing that I could come up with for like actual benefits that are likely taking place for an athlete. It's not that it's, you know, being actually digested and sent to the muscles most likely. And, and you know, most cyclocross races, especially for amateurs are going to be 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, and then, you know, if you're toward the high end of that cat one or something else, you might be at 60 minutes, um, for different races, but even then a lot of the time they're 45 minutes, it's really tough. I, you know, in mountain biking, you'll see them take in their gels and their bottles in the feed zone or across the finish line, finish straight. And in cyclocross, when I have seen athletes taking in a gel, it's only on the finish straight. And that finish straight has to be one that allows that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Like you said, Ivy, really rare that that actually comes into play. Um, but I, you know, I, I have, I am distracted by the process of taking in a gel when I'm racing, like is in an intense format. Like if it's road racing or anything else, that's totally different. But when you're doing cross country Olympic and there are a lot of courses where I'm just like, I can't, I can't take one in. Um, it's, it's not going to be able to happen because it's just too complicated. Maybe the feed zone's rough and bumpy, or it's like you're, you're weaving in and out in that feed zone. Um, maybe you're racing constantly with somebody. It's really tough. So I actually have this weird thing where I, that makes me think, okay, no nutrient, no carbs during the race from a gel. I'll take it in with my drink. And in cyclocross, you may not even have a bottle on the bike, but it really what it forces me to do is think about what I'm eating leading up to that race. Like I really want to be ready with the carbs that I have on board. So then I don't have to rely on it. And even for caffeine, I'd much rather do something like, um, any of like the, I know run gum is a brand and I'm sure there's a bunch of other brands that do it, but I found that like the gum releases caffeine way in a way more controlled manner, um, for at least me, a non-habitual caffeine intaker. And as a result, um, when I do take it, it, if I take it through like a gel or anything else like that, I just feel like I'm shaking and I'm going to shake off my bike. So, uh, I, I, I don't, uh. I think it's probably just a mental benefit of having it. That's that's at least the most that I can come down to. Ivy, do you, do you have any final differing opinion on that? Nope, I agree. Um, yeah, and I don't feel like I maybe answered very succinctly initially in that, um, you know, I think that uh, this shouldn't be used as like a catch up for carbs. Like mm -hmm. the, during the race shouldn't be the moment when you catch up on any of that stuff. Um, but yeah, mm -hmm. I'm with you. The idea of trying to do that and plan on that in the race is so stressful to me. Um, I yeah, definitely like you, to preload. If you come into a, something as short as a cycle cross race in such a glycogen deplete state that a gel is going to make a difference, then you're doomed from the start. You're not even going to, yes. mm -hmm. you're not even going to get to a point where that gel can save you. And you know, this is, I've used blood glucose monitoring devices and I've used this whole, you know, tested those out and the jury's still out on how actually accurate those are. And I've seen kind of wild, uh, wildly different uh, results with when the, when your blood sugar tends to rise, uh, when you take something in on the bike, but in every case, it was certainly a lot longer than I thought, at least as indicated by the glucose monitor, but who knows if that's actually measuring everything accurately and representative of reality. But what was the was quickest like response you saw? 20 minutes. Yeah. That was the fastest. Typically I would see it start to kick in somewhere around 30 minutes and a little later. So, um, also something interesting and I don't know if, and this is really hard to measure, but it seems like, and you know, it would make logical sense. So once again, alarm bell goes off for me here. Um, I don't know if this is the case, but, uh, when work rate would increase and it would become increasingly glycolytic, it seemed like, you know, my blood sugar would increase to a certain point, but then if that was a particularly long effort, it would drop down bunch of minefields in trying to interpret that data effectively and actually know what's going on. And depending on the sensor itself, I found that like, I would repeat the exact same circumstances, but you know, I had a different sensor in because the sensors expire and the sensor would change. So I don't know, there's a whole lot of, uh, trickiness to all of that, but just the same, at least based on that data, which who knows if it's representative of reality, the fastest I saw was 20 minutes, but typically it was 30 to 45. So basically you take that gel on the start line and that's your best hope at getting a, a, like some sort of aid toward the end of the race. 
And if you look at that, that's actually quite common, right, Ivy? Like if they do take in a totally. gel, it's not uncommon to see on the starting line while you're waiting for the gun to go off. That's when they would take it. We all be eating gels on the start line. And when yeah. you're thinking about, you know, and what Chad is mentioning about how long it really takes for something like a gel to really take effect. And like John, like you were saying, maybe 20 minutes as long as 30 or 45 what about the decay rate? Like just because that is when it really starts taking effect and you start to feel it, does that mean that you only have a five minute window for it to be effective? You know, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. there's no reason that you can't feel comfortable doing it at the beginning of a race and understanding that it will, by the time that it takes effect, um, you know, you're going to still be racing even when it's still effective. It's not like there's a five minute window where it's best and then it goes away, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's tricky. There's a lot that we still have to figure out about that stuff. If only we had like Miss Frizzle in the magic school bus, she figures all that stuff out. So firsthand, uh, that's what we need to figure out exercise metabolism a bit better. Uh, Ray's question says, first off, I want to shout out your support staff. I had a question or concern that your train now feature was not working right for me. They took a little while, dug into the history and was able to get back to me and answer my question. Super helpful. Uh, so thanks. Awesome, Ray. And yeah, our, our support staff, like if you ever have questions on the product, I see some people sending them to trainer road, they go to trainerroadcom slash podcast. And where you submit podcast questions, you're like, my device won't pair. That is the wrong place. I am not the person to ask. Uh, instead <laughs> you should reach out to our support team. You can do live chat or you can go support at trainerroad.com and just email them at any point. They're awesome. They're all real people. We don't like outsource any of that. We go through really extensive training with our support agents. Um, some of them are pro athletes. A lot of them are just general athletes or just general folks that have a really good grasp and understanding of this. And we work a lot on constant education with this and they're really good. They're just awesome. So, and a pleasure to talk to. So I'm glad to hear that, Ray. A race says, I'm hoping Chad can answer my question about your different types of threshold workouts. And if there's a difference between them, you have threshold workouts that are just under in the 95 to 99% range at around five to 15 minutes, then something like over unders that typically bounce between 95 to 105%. And also ramp type workouts like Paiute that ramp and step their way from 60% and 10% increments all the way up into the threshold zone. Uh, these typically tend to be around like longer ones around 10 to 15 minutes. Ray says, I found myself recently preferring the ramp and step threshold workouts instead of over unders and not really sure why, as they all hurt, uh, do these workouts all meet the same intent or is one better than the other? If you race triathlons versus road racing versus crit racing versus mountain bike racing. Thanks for a great product. I would not have qualified and finished Kona last year without trainer road from Ray. And I think that's Ray Brankis. Ray amazing job. He's one of our successful athletes, uh, podcast guests You can check that out. And yeah, Ray qualified for Kona. Pretty amazing. Tons of athletes, uh, qualified for Kona last year using training room, exciting stuff. Uh, Chad, um, I jotted down some notes here on this one. Feel free to disregard my notes entirely. If you wish. Um, what do you think on this one in terms of are there different goals based on these steady state ones that might be sub threshold over unders and then ramping efforts, are different goals to these different outcomes. Hmm. So two things. First, um, he says he found himself recently preferring the ramp step threshold workouts. And I did one of those this morning and I've avoided those for literally years and <laughs> they're the worst. They're so hard, <laughs> but everything's, everything is that hard right now. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I want to restate Ray's question is do these workouts all meet the same intent or is one better than the other? If you race triathlons versus road racing versus crit racing versus mountain bike racing to which I answer yes. And yes. Because they they do all meet the same intent, which is to improve muscular endurance. And when we say muscular endurance, it may not mean a whole lot to you, but we're talking about increasing muscular capability, basically repetition to the cranks. So it's largely aerobically driven, but when we're pushing this hard, there's a fair amount of anaerobic contribution, but this is still very much an aerobic stimulus that just kind of touches on the aerobic side of things. So it's a bit... Uh, I won't say the best of both worlds. It's 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 really good in the aerobic side and pretty good on the anaerobic side. But in any case, it yields the ability to increase your muscular endurance. And when we talk about the the many many terms that describe functional threshold power and lactate threshold and onset of blood lactate, and maximal lactate, steady state, and all these different terms, that implies that everyone can do that much work for that same duration, and it doesn't work that way. If you do something that is a so-called estimate of your hour power, that's not the same thing. It's, it's very much not something a person can do for an hour. And what I mean by that is if you were to lab test and you hit a particular 
lactate level and man, do we need to get away from using lactate for a lot of these things? Cause there's yeah. just too many things going on over the last couple of years. That's conversation for another time. Yeah. <laughs> you get to a point where you can do this amount of work. A 20 minute test says you can hold this many Watts. Well, you can hold that many Watts for anywhere from, it could be 15 minutes to 75 minutes, depending on your level of muscle endurance. So it's a very conditionable aspect of your training. So once you hit that particular physiological turn point, how long can you stay there? And, and when we do threshold workouts, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to grow the ability to stay there without, you know, pushing yourself into, into the red zone. So yeah, the intent of all of them is similar, but when you consider what you need to steer that muscle endurance at, then you have to decide how specific, and, and we do that for you through the training plan progression or the you know, training phase progression, which of these workouts is most specific to what I need to do. I want to brace myself for the specific sort of stress that I'm going to face when performance matters to me, you know, race day or whatever it may be. Yeah. That when I'm thinking about those ramp efforts, uh, Ray, I, I don't blame you for seeing that you prefer those ones. Uh, for me, they're the easiest type because eventually it really does hurt. It's like a crescendo and boy, it adds up <laughs> toward the end. Uh, but if you look at overall time, there's less overall time suffering for me, uh, with those yeah. ones. Um, so I, I can understand that. And they do produce like a lot of lactate because generally those ramping ones step you past your threshold, <clears throat> like uh, significantly. So, you know, they'll get you way high up there into the higher reaches of a threshold. And then as a result, uh, yeah, boom, you, you boom goes the dynamite and you feel like you're going to blow up and you do, and then you get to reset and do it again. When it comes to over unders, that seems like Chad, like what we're really like, one of the great benefits of over-unders is it really focuses on building your body's ability to shuttle lactate. Once it accumulates when you're around there, the intent at least is the goal that it, it would take your body and make it so that it's more capable at reprocessing that lactate and then uh, carrying on with it. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd like to say, I agree. And that's what science used to tell us. And that's the theories that we used to posit, but it's uh, man, just the use of the term lactate shuttle is, is tricky because there are so many different lactate shuttles that have, that have come to light over the last couple of years that we can't even, it, it's just a tricky term to use. And really we shouldn't even talk about lactate so much as acidification is the acidification ramps up, whether it's in the blood or it's in the muscle and it's going to be in both. It's really the acidification. That's the limiter, you know, the, the hydrogen ions and not trying to get scientific with it, just trying to steer us away from using lactate as uh, or pinning a negative association with it, a painful association with it. High lactate levels yeah. are a good thing. Lactate's always present. It's the preferred fuel for just about everything in our body. I mean, there's so many good things about lactate. I'd rather we just term it acidification, but that, that that's beside yeah. the point. Um, so many of these are just teaching us to better process fuel. I mean, we, let's not make it about lactate. Let's just make it about our ability to metabolize fuel so that we can do work. So we're just increasing work capacity. And in this case, we're increasing work capacity at a really, really uncomfortably, but sustainably high output level. And on, and, and the, aside from the physiological benefits that go with it, I think threshold is perhaps the best at increasing your psychological capabilities because it's sustained pain. You just sit there and deal with it. And you get good at compartmentalizing it. You get good at remaining cognitively functioning while, well, a whole lot of your central resources are dedicated to just managing discomfort. You get familiar with what it feels like to work hard. So that when it comes time to work hard, when it matters, this is, this is known territory. I've been here before. I'm here basically three or four times a week. I know what to do. I know I can do this. It's one of the rare combinations of like, uh, uh, extreme discomfort that's also sustainable. Um, mm -hmm. and, and like, and it's particularly sustainable. I think cyclists in general and triathletes, like they, they spend a lot of time around that range runners do as well, but not as much, uh, because of the fact that if you're running at threshold all the time, that's quite a load on your muscles and on your legs and musculature and joints and everything else. And as a result, runners will spend less time doing higher intensity. Right. Um, but cyclists on the other hand, uh, you can spend a lot of time there, relatively speaking to the rest of your training. Hopefully it's not, you know, all of what you're doing, but yeah, it's, it's unique. And I think that it's honestly, um, it makes you really tough and it's the sort of training that if you can do that sort of thing, uh, I find that if I'm really good at threshold work, you can throw anaerobic efforts at me. You can throw plenty of other things. And it's like, it feels mm -hmm. so easy to my mind and to my body compared to enduring those longer threshold intervals that, 
it's okay. Like, like I'm fine. I can make it through what I've done in training is so much harder, you know, and not to make this anecdotal, but I raced best when I could, when, when I probably had a, the healthiest diet of threshold work in my training regimen. Mm -hmm. That's it. it, I think the old phrase, uh, what was it? Hunter Allen's phrase was the sweet spot. You won't win races, but you'll never lose a race sort of thing. You'll always be Mm -hmm. in the hunt, even though if you won't necessarily have the capabilities of winning a sort of thing, I think threshold just ups that ante quite a lot. I think it makes it so that you can, you can win races. If all you did was were were threshold work over unders, the like, and things where you're slightly above threshold, slightly below threshold. And I'm not saying only do that, but if you had a healthy dose of that in your training plan, an adequate dose of it, 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 it would make you a very formidable racer on a lot of levels. Yeah. In lieu of like VO2 max anaerobic, anything else like that. Right. Chad, like mm-hmm. when you look at the intensity inclusion into your plan, thresholds darn effective. Um, that's, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Ivy, um, specificity comes to mind, uh, especially with Ray's question about like, does it, are certain ones best for different types of athletes? Is there a particular type of threshold workout that you prefer to do for specific disciplines because you've raced road, you've raced at the, at a pro level, cyclocross at a pro level, mountain biking, all this stuff. Um, are there specific ones or do you, do you loathe them all equally? (laughs) Uh, um, well, I'm thinking about, um, excuse me, Ray, I don't know, talking about over unders and excuse me being not sure why they all really hurt and thinking about how those specifically feel in a race scenario where I feel like something like an over under helps me, uh, better react to changes in pace, um, Mm -hmm. more so than something like a sustained threshold effort or a ramping effort, you know? Um, so yes, those hurt really badly, but I feel like those efforts specifically help me respond to changes in race race paces and be able to recover from them most effectively. Um, because they never seem to be like a really huge on off the things that really break me in like a race ride or in a road race are when it just gets like a little uncomfortably too hard. And then we settle back in, not just like a Mm -hmm. big on and a big off that doesn't really happen in a race scenario, you know? Um, Yeah. And that's like something that, uh, it, again, over unders, I find that they're quite productive at helping you deal with, you get pretty good at maintaining threshold intensities. So if you're doing a breakaway or anything else like that, and it's the short sort of breakaway, you're pretty well prepared with over unders, but also when you get into a pace line or when people start attacking you and being able to recover relatively quickly from that, even if it goes above what is typically an over under sort of thing, man, they're just really productive. Um, I've been noticing really- also, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead, Chad. Oh, it's already interrupt. That that's what so many short races are. It's just a bunch of over unders because you can't go too high above and then go way below and expect to hang in there. Short races, you know, by their very nature, are are hard the whole time. That's just how it goes. And you can't go hard hard that whole race, and you can't go easy unless you get tailed off. So it's basically there are so many races. I, I, man, I almost want to say anything under maybe an hour and a half is just going to be a series of over-unders, some a little more extreme than others, but you're always going to be right around what you can barely hang on to. Yeah, exactly. Um, why it's, that's why it's so good for, for that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, uh, super interesting. And to think of this, of uh, the value on threshold work, I think that threshold work is, could be wrong here. Um, but I think it's like one of the most skipped workouts that you can mm. see in, uh, across like the library or across the history of what people do. Yeah, I understand horrible. because it's, <laughs> yeah, I understand because it's hard. Um, but you know what, like if you can do it, it's so productive. So, um, these are the sort of days too. And I have threshold work, like, you know, I'm really making sure that I'm feeling well, I can kind of cheat and get by on VO2 without feeling very well for me personally, for some people, it might be different. Right. But like, you know, I could go through the day and like, oh, I didn't have like a, 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 a normal size lunch and I was only able to snack through the day. If that's on a threshold day, like I'm a little worried <laughs> if it's a VO two day, I can probably get by without it. So it's worth when you have those sort of workouts coming up, it's worth doing your homework, getting ready, uh, making sure that you have everything that you need, um, to be able to do and treat those so, like race days in terms of, yeah. um, like nutrition and leading Healing. up to the workout yeah. itself. I treat those like race days because they're so important like nailing those workouts are so important. And, um, even the mental Mm. edge of feeling like you're super prepared for it helps you achieve it that much more, you know? 
Oh, and it's probably and and a great point wrapping back to the first question that we addressed today too, is this is not the day to deprive yourself and particularly during the workout and after, because uh, like Chad said, it's extremely productive, but it also en enacts quite the toll on your body uh, because you're able to spend a lot of time at a difficult intensity that's pulling on both strings, aerobic and anaerobics there. So <clears throat> this is the sort of day to like, if you occasionally drink recovery drinks, that's the day to do it. Uh, if you get to the end of the ride and you still have some carb mix in your bottle, drink it. Like, you know, if you're thinking about what to eat after the ride, make sure that you eat it, whatever it is. Uh, that's the sort of time that you really want to give your body as much tailwind as possible on being able to absorb that sort of training and rebuild and recover from it. So, um, super important, uh, stuff there. Okay. Janelle's question. Um, I'm going to, uh, shorten this one up and, and kind of just cover some basics thereafter, but. Uh, Janelle's basic question is how do you get so many carbs in your diet that are not junk when you're trying to get carbs in throughout the day? So Janelle's mentioning that, you know, they're taking in more carbs on the bike and that's through gels, mixes, everything else. Uh, there's a lot of different options there, but looking at taking in carbohydrates off the bike, uh, Janelle mentions the fact that going through this after tracking on my fitness pal for a week, uh, discover the major changes I've made over the last months have resulted in amazing gains in protein per day. Uh, my fat per day is high, which I guarantee you for any person that tracks their food in a diary, you will recognize how like, um, easy it is to have plenty of fat in your diet, right? It's just, it's in everything and it's, it a little bit goes a long way. So it's easy to get a lot of it. Um, but then she says, however, my carbs are so low. Um, so the question is, um, how do you get so many carbs in your diet that are not junk since changing my nutrition to a much more whole food diet with lots of good protein and fat, I'm struggling with eating enough carbs and I don't want to do a low carb diet. Uh, so it's a great question. And in general, I feel like, uh, this is something that I bet a lot of athletes run into once they actually start measuring their food and it does become a little more complex, especially if, uh, we don't understand, uh, what carbohydrates could be. Ivy, uh, what are your thoughts? First thoughts on answering? Janelle's well, question. my first thoughts are that I should provide clarification that I got, I got flustered and read my notes <clears throat> incorrectly. And I know that sugar is a carb. Okay. <laughs> Live recording is scary and I get flustered and <laughs> read and write things incorrectly. So sorry. <laughs> but I mean, I think Janelle, um, I see this a lot with athletes that, uh, you know, associate carbs with something that is negative because Janelle is saying, how do you get so, so many carbs in your diet that are not junk? Um, so we're thinking of like really simple, um, simple carbs and like, uh, you know, like sugars, there's carbs everywhere, like potatoes, vegetables, um, you know, do athletes not know that, um, the spectrum of where carbs can come from are vast and not bad at all. Um, like things like potatoes and vegetables that are great complex carbs are never junk. Um, and so I wonder mm -hmm. like what the scope of variety in Janelle's source of carbs really look like, or, mm -hmm. um, you know, if there's a predisposition to want sweet stuff or really simple carbs, because that's what you're used to. And that's what makes you feel satiated. And like breaking that habit might be hard. Um, that's tricky. I have, I have three categories that I think of when I'm trying to get in carbohydrate. That's I, I think of grains, I think of legumes and I think of fruit. Um, and then within that, you also have, like Ivy said, um, you know, you have things like sweet potatoes, potatoes, you have, uh, tons of different options that you can pick within vegetables too. But if you do whole grains, legumes and fruit, you can get a whole lot of, of carbohydrates in your diet, just from those three things. So typically like the, the plates that I'm having throughout the week that are really common, um, they have a mix of those three things. It might be black beans. It might be pinto beans. It might be lentils. Um, or it could be something like me getting in a bunch of sweet potatoes, which I love chopping up sweet potatoes. And then I just, I just spray them with olive oil. Like, uh, I have like a little spritzer with the olive oil, spritz them with that, throw on some cracked pepper, some sea salt and a bit of garlic on there. And boom, you have amazing, delicious little, uh, sweet potato chunks that you can put on anything. And it's a really good base for a lot of different meals that you can do that you then can add things on top of super easy, uh, brown rice too, really easy to cook and to get going whole wheat pasta. Uh, there's a lot of different options that you can do there. 
And then in addition to that, or whole grain pasta, forgive me, in addition to that, once you start getting into the fruit side of things, I use fruit typically surrounding my workouts more often. And then what I do is outside of that, then I'll add in all of the whole grains and the legumes and everything else outside of that. Uh, I find that it really helps to cook out those sort of things that are, because I use those as like the base of what I'm eating. And I find it very helpful to cook those in bulk. And this isn't like I'm separating it all into containers or anything else. It's just, I'm not going to cook like a huge thing of brown or like, I'm not going to cook a small thing of brown rice for every individual meal. You can get the prepackaged ones if it makes it easier. Uh, in terms of what the nutritional value is, I haven't seen any studies showing that prepackaged brown rice in like two serving packets that you can do that you can just put in the microwave or worse than doing any other sort of brown rice. Uh, they might be, I don't know, but you can just do that. Uh, that makes it really easy. It can just be a bit more expensive. Uh, so I'll typically just cook a decent amount of brown rice for a few days. And then I have that and the same thing with the sweet potatoes and everything else. So it's, um, that's how I get them, get it into my diet, um, by focusing on those three categories. So. Well, and it feels like, um, a trend that I'm picking up on with what you're describing, John is getting a lot of carbs is much easier when you have a lot of variety. Like oh, totally. if you're just focusing on just <clears throat> grains or just pasta or like just potatoes, of course mm -hmm. it'd be difficult. Like, so for someone like me that weighs 142 ish pounds, like 64, 65 kilograms. Like I need, you know, more than six or 700 grams of carbs a day. And if I were to do all of that just by rice or potatoes, yeah. it would be such a bummer. I couldn't do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You have to have that variety. Or just beans. Oh yeah. God. Just beans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, you know, with different sort of bread and everything else that you can bring in, you can find a lot of different options. Um, and bread is like this endless journey that you can go down with different varieties and everything else that, and it's mm -hmm. truly like a, uh, enjoyable thing. Chad's, uh, Chad regularly gives me really nice olive oil and I love it. Um, so what we'll do a lot of the time is we'll, like in the evening for some sort of snack before or like ramping into dinner or after dinner, something like that. We'll make like bruschetta and we'll use it with like nice bread that we get. And then just a touch of little really good olive oil on there. Oh, it's amazing. So experiment with it. Um, but really if you start to think of like your carbs as like a base and you're thinking of whole grains, legumes, and then fruit, it makes it really easy to start to add up those things in a lot of different varieties uh, pretty quickly. So that's what I would recommend, Janelle, is to think of those three categories and then to push then on with that. Jonathan just touched on breads, which is one I was going to mention because it hadn't been mentioned yet. Um, and there's so many, so many ways to work bread into a meal. Tortillas is another one. And then cereals. And all these things can be done whole grain. They can be done low on fat if that's a concern. Um, and they're all easily these are the more calorie dense version of things. And I think that's kind of what you might benefit from. I mean, if you don't want to eat a ton of quantity, then you got to eat a ton of high, uh, kind of high quality. In this case, mm -hmm. you just want high caloric density. Uh, but I, I, all of that aside, and that's all good information. You talk about, you briefly mentioned running out of batteries when I really needed them. And I don't know what that means because that could mean coming into races under fuel. That could mean not managing your nutrition over the course of a race very well. I wonder, and the question I would ask you if, if we were having a conversation is how do you, how do you know your, your carbohydrate intake is low? So now you, you've recognized you're getting good protein, you're getting good fat. Well, if you're, if you're managing those things, well, I wonder what those sources are that are somehow omitting carbohydrate intake because, mm -hmm. and I mean, if you're getting the work done, if you're getting your workouts done, if you're competing well, if you're not fading at the line or fading over the course of it says to me that your carbohydrate intake is at least adequate. So I, I just want to understand why you think your carbohydrate intake is so low. It's, and I find that it's actually quite easy to get into that position, Chad, when you're like, a um, when your diet revolves heavily around salad. Um, I know, and mm -hmm. this is really common, right? Because, uh, mm -hmm. in those situations, what you end up taking in is you end up taking like a bowl full of vegetables or greens, which is amazing. And it should continue, right? Like that, yeah. that's not a bad thing. But it's really hard to start to add in carbohydrate to that. And if that replaces a meal, suddenly you have one third less of a chance if you're eating three meals a day. So of, many vegetables are not sort of carbohydrate dense. They're not nutrient or they are nutrient dense. They're not calorically dense. That's that's yes. a, that's the beauty of them. They've got so many good things and they don't heap on the calories. But if you're trying to up your 
carbohydrate intake and you're going about it via vegetables, you have to be pretty selective which vegetables you choose. Yeah. In the evenings, Salad ain't gonna cut it. Yeah. In the evenings, that's typically when I have my my bowl of greens and and all sorts of awesome colors and vegetables and everything else. And 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 because I'm not I don't work out after that, right? I'm ready to ready to go. Top it off with a bunch of micro micronutrients feels really good. And then or surrounding training, that's when I'm getting in the most dense uh, form of carbs. Chad, you mentioned cereal, another great option, which is, mm. this is analogous to or the same as cereal, but is granola. Like it's it's a good way that you can add things in. They typically are going to have something like um, some sort of like a, whether it's maple syrup or something within there to add a bit yeah, of like bonding to the oats. In there. Uh huh. Candied fruits and all those things can give you a decent form of carbohydrates pretty quick. Um, so not Captain Crunch is what you're saying. Really- <laughs> oh no, Captain Crunch stays. That's the <laughs> In staple. A pinch. I mean, yeah. leaves. <laughs> <laughs> Dom, what's your oh. favorite uh, kind of legume to get carbs from? Uh, black beans. Like I, okay. I, I like black beans. That's my favorite one. Um, I'm not sure if it's nutritionally more uh, or less beneficial than another one, but. It's my favorite one because it tends to be the most flexible. So I can have it if I'm doing something that's almost like more of like a Mediterranean style dish, or if I can, if I'm swapping over to something that's Mexican or any yeah. number of different things, it's just super flexible. Um, you can have well, it's it wild everything. too that like all just like Chad is saying, like all vegetables are not carb dense, all legumes aren't either. So, like, mm-hmm. uh, chickpeas or garbanzo mm-hmm. beans, there's only eight grams of carbs in, um, or like 120 grams in like one cup. So if I were to just do garbanzo beans to try to meet my carb goal, I'd have to eat like six cans of garbanzo beans. But <laughs> <laughs> sounds like the saddest meal ever. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but black beans in one cup, there's 44 grams of carbs. Yeah, so more. Yeah. And Gosh, this is like hard. Uh, to give you, if you have brown rice, sweet potatoes, black beans, some salsa that's pulling in like some vegetables or anything else and has usually some sort of like, you know, um, fructose ish sort of experience that you're getting from that. And if you have all that wrapped up into a bowl, like suddenly you're getting a variety and then throw in a tortilla, something else, bam, like you've got a lot of, so basically burritos, they're the best things that we can have. And we should just have them all the time, but (laughs) new new cereal name though, new cereal Mm -hmm. name idea, fructose experience. (laughs) (laughs) I did I like that. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, by the way, we get a request to sponsor the podcast all the time. And we recently got one from Halo Top. Oh, I probably shouldn't have even said that. I don't want to give them any coverage or anything. But Dang that's it, like an ice cream it. company. You I know, just gave them a... the, the exposure. Oh, I know. Good Darn. I, yeah, I know. And we didn't even get free ice cream for it. But um, Maxine, bleep that out in post. Um, <laughs> But anyways, yeah, like I saw that one and I was like, this is the first one that I've ever been intrigued by. Like <laughs> free ice cream. Would be pretty cool. Now you got my interest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The yeah, bikes. Nah, nah, we're good. Ice cream. That's a different deal. Uh, anyways, we are not sponsored by said company and we will not be. Okay. Mark <clears throat> says, I'm, this is the last one we'll cover for today. I'm not a racer, but I love hearing a lot of the race strategy and tactics discussions. One thing I've heard a number of times, but don't understand is why crosswinds are so challenging and so hated. I understand that it's unpleasant, but I just don't get why it's so bad. Uh, I can, you know, I mean, I guess that there, so first of all, there's one side of things. If you watch the tour de France, the reason that it gets brought up is because they're striving just starving for something interesting on those days. And they're riding through endless sunflower fields for like six hours. So the crosswinds are very hyped, first of all, uh, in those situations. So that's like one thing to keep in mind is to keep the grain of salt handy with what you're hearing with commentary. These um, like commentators doing the tour de France, bless their hearts, like six hours a day for three weeks, having to talk and find something interesting to talk about. Um, go easy on them too. I see a lot of people being really like aggressive and mean to them. Just, you know, go easy on them. So uh, but some that's one them. thing to keep me. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Chad some, reserves. Some of them can the just, right. just lay yeah. waste to them. Let them have it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they deserve uh, it. <laughs> yeah. Um, now within this, yes, crosswinds are really challenging. Chad, do you, do you want to, I mean, you've had lots <clears throat> of road racing experience. Do you want to break down why crosswinds are so challenging in a race situation? Yeah. So in a big field, it just drastically reduces the the draft benefit of the field. So whereas, you know, with a, the headwind or even a slight crosswind, you can tuck in anywhere in a big mass of riders. But when you have a block crosswind, I don't know if that's a term, but when it's just a crosswind and you have to echelon across the road, road's only so wide. 
And once you run out of road, you have to start another echelon, which is effectively another person taking the brunt of the wind. So instead of having four or five people, six people taking the brunt at a spearhead shaped field, you've got one person and a string of riders off to the left or right, then another one person and a string of riders off to the left or the right. So nobody gets a real big benefit from the draft. The person farthest left or right at the end of that, that, that echelon is gaining the most, but even then it is way more work than being tucked in to a 80 man or 80 rider field somewhere in the middle or toward the back. And then with smaller groups, it's just hard to gauge. I mean, unless the, it's a straight road and the wind is consistently coming from an angle, you're constantly shifting around. That means the rider in front of you or behind you is constantly shifting around. You have to make all these micro adjustments to find that sweet spot. And that sweet spot is a moving target. So mm -hmm. trying to manage a, a headwind is already difficult, but then when it's coming from the side, trying to find that spot is especially difficult. And it always calls to mind at one team time trial in our, at our just go-to course out in uh, North of Reno, it went around a little, a little lake and, and it, we didn't do the team time trial often, but when we did do it, I absolutely loved it because I was typically on a team who know how who knew how to manage crosswinds. And I got to say on an open road, traffic, both ways, four rider teams stretched out across an entire lane. We were not popular with the locals, but <laughs> you kind of had to just, just bear that criticism or you know, the, the angry drivers and horns and the, through the threat of us losing the course. And if you wanted to make use of it, and there was one time in particular, our group of four riders echeloned out, we rolled by a strict pace line of riders who were all just suffering their own slow deaths because each of them was effectively right in the wind. We blew by them like they were standing still and, and yelled to them crosswind echelon crosswind echelon and no no chance they received that message or did anything to <laughs> to change it because they're just yeah. inexperienced but it yeah. showed the the stark difference because we were definitely putting out more power but we weren't putting out that much more power and we sailed by them because we knew how to effectively manage a crosswind mm. and in a field right ivy this is what everybody is having to like so and that diagonal line that forms is the echelon. And when that runs out of room and then you have to form another one, that's and instantly that's a gap, right? Like there's a right. gap in the field that's opened up. And then to close that gap, you don't have draft that you can write into. So it makes it extra hard, right? You have to, to any gap that opens up, it can expand and expand and it can just, you can even be 15 feet away, but never close that gap because yeah. it's just, that, you'd have to ride too hard. And think about the rotation of the pace line, the through and off nature of it. I mean, when it's a straight line, it's so easy to get right. But when it's stretched out like that and you have to recede behind this diagonal line and find your way to the end of it without coming into contact with probably another echelon right behind you, if it's a big field, I mean, it's, it's tricky stuff. Mm -hmm. And you're hoping that when you rotate off the rest of the group is moving to allow you to slot in. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. And they don't, not <laughs> they because do not. sometimes because of ignorance, but like other times because it's a race tactic, um, you know, uh, mm -hmm. when a team has five or six riders left and they're, they will only make space in the echelon for five or six riders and everyone else has to do the equitable, like the same amount of work, um, in order to receive a draft when they have to create their own new echelon, you know? So, yeah. uh, being that first person to not be in the echelon um and be in that weird zone of not getting the draft and not having room it's just like such a horrible stressful situation to be in because the only way out it's not like you can um when you're really being guttered and there's nowhere else to ride it's not like you can just muscle it out and like put in a big effort to like go around a group you know you're kind of stuck there um, yeah, it, it's so stressful. <laughs> it's, it's really tricky because it alters the entire like rules of, of engagement in a road race, because the rules of engagement in a road race are almost entirely based upon the fact that you are riding forward into the wind. As a result, you have riders that will sacrifice themselves and go to the front. You have riders that save themselves. You have the ability to be able to send a rider back and then have riders pull them back up. Because once again, the wind is coming on from you know, the majority of the wind is coming on from the front. 
And because of that, they've kind of like engineered this whole sport and the road is long, not wide. And as a result, you can do a lot and have a lot of flexibility with that. Your team tactics are probably built off that too. Suddenly when the wind shifts and it's a crosswind, maybe those riders that were up front don't have the gas to actually hold pace in an echelon. Because typically if you're doing a pace line and it's, you're going into a headwind, the efforts aren't quite as hard as when you're going into, when you're doing an echelon, because with an echelon, you're typically exposed to more wind. Like Chad said, it's constantly always shifting and you're making these micro adjustments. So it's not like you're just getting a free ride until it's your time to pull into the wind at the front of that diagonal line. You're having to work your way through on the way back and on the way up to that lead position in that echelon. So if you have riders that are suddenly tired or they've been tired because of the work they've been doing, or you have riders out of position and your lead riders back there, the reason there's so much stress and chaos is because it's suddenly your lead riders out of the game. Like they, and they are not going to be able to leap up four groups of echelons and go up there unless they have somehow the magic of having everybody fresh enough and motivated, motivated enough to work together to pull that rider up to the front. It's really difficult. And all you need is one group, like what Chad was talking about to be in one diagonal line. That's just really well regimented and working together and boom, their gap is going to increase over everybody. And it's just not going to come down. Well, that's, <clears throat> that's another complication too, because if you have a big field moving into a headwind, then you've got the riders who are cool with doing the work. They, that's their, <clears throat> that's their role. They have that strength. They're okay with it. And then that echelon, that first echelon takes shape. Those are the riders that form that first echelon. All the subsequent echelons are riders who are previously hiding from the wind. They weren't, they're not cool with working right now. This is not yeah. <laughs> what they plan to be doing just yet. And now you have to hope that a rider out of each small group of those riders is willing to be the first in that line. And just the, the cohesion doesn't just readily establish itself. It's a, a lot of moving parts, a lot of resistance, a lot of people who don't want to work, don't want to work right there. It's, it's a very complicated situation. And, and it's technically can... hard too, right? Ivy, like it's, it's hard to, oh my gosh. it's not just easy. Like a pace line is relatively easy. Uh, you know, you just have to not hit the rider in front of you and keep your pace relatively smooth, but an echelon it's, it's complicated. Right. And requires a lot of trust for the people that you're riding with, you know, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of overlap. Exactly. Yeah, you're, you're like intentionally doing what you're not supposed to do as they say, <laughs> right? Wheeling Which everyone. is overlap a wheel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and all of these things are what makes it even more complicated. You know, what Chad is describing about the dynamics of these different echelons and groups is oftentimes it takes us by surprise, you know, mm -hmm. when you're describing like a headwind or regular race or race ride scenario, um, where we, everything's controlled and you can take control of all these situations in different ways. Like from a technical perspective, this surprises us a lot of the times, um, especially mm -hmm. in a race scenario when you turn a corner or, mm -hmm. um, you know, reach a new exposed part of the course and you're surprised by, by a crosswind like that. Um, you could be snacking at the back. You could be a rider that your team is protecting that is totally well rested. And if you're in the wrong spot at the wrong time, it doesn't matter how fresh you are or, you know, if everyone's surprised by it, um, the cards just kind of fall as they may and no amount of, uh, pre-planning or technical ability can kind of save you at that point, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, that there is very much within most road racing groups. There's kind of like a rank and file of control. And I'm not saying it should be that way. That's just what happens. Like uh, a dominant team is there. They take control. They put all their riders into the right position, whatever it might be. And then suddenly what this does is that uh, crosswind weakens that and it throws in some anarchy and some chaos. And as a result, that's why it causes a whole lot of stress too in the field. It's always really interesting though, to see the teams that perform really well in cross twins. Um, quick step always seems like a team that's just well-versed and ready, even though they've changed out their roster, you know, over the years, they're always like, <clears throat> they're just ready for it, you know? Um, and they know what to do and know how to react to that sort of situation. Um, super fun. And, and you can actually, you can practice echelons when there's no crosswind. Um, if you're out there with your group of friends or anything else like that, and as long as the road's safe and allows that sort of thing, it's good to practice because then you get to at least learn the rotation, the patterns and how things end up surging and stuff. You'll be exposed to the wind more that way too, just in a different way. Um, and it's a good thing to practice. Uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd highly recommend it as long as you can do it in under safe circumstances. So 
It feels so yeah. great when you really nail it and you're really in a great echelon and feel, it feels mm-hmm. truly restful to be in that situation when you're doing it right. It's awesome. Yeah. And it's cool because you know that everybody else is panicking, right? Like yeah. you, you're just <laughs> nailing it. So it feels pretty good. And it, maybe we should back up a little bit because I just processed that Mark started this whole question with, I am not a racer. And we keep using terms like, like through and off is simply in a, in a rotating pace line, one rider's working in the wind. As soon as they've you know made a couple pedal strokes, they're pulling off to the side. The next rider's rotating through. So through and off. Um, if you guys can think of any other terms we've flung out there that maybe don't make sense to Mark and non-racers. Yeah, I think that we've operated entirely on the race context, right? Um, so when I say about the rules of engagement in a race and everything else, they don't apply to the same degree. They do apply in the sense that you're just fighting physics. So you typically get everybody together and that sort of thing, since you're riding forward into, you know, at a certain speed that creates a headwind at the very least. Um, but I, I do think that with racing, the, the fear is bad placement or something, but it's actually the same across the board is just getting dropped and then being alone in that wind is scary uh, to think of having to cover whatever distance that you have left on that ride and to do it alone without any sort of uh, person to draft off of. And that's why you'll see so much, uh, so much attention, focus and like, and, and importance laid on to making sure that you're in a good position with that sort of situation, even if you're not racing. So, um, I've had that situation before where I've just gotten kicked out the back of a, of a ride and it's a long, sad ride home, uh, sitting there in the crosswind, <laughs> pushing a lot of Watts to hardly move forward. So, uh, so yeah, good, good conversation. makes me want to go out there and actually ride and do uh, some echelons right now. So exciting stuff. Uh, thanks everybody for listening. Uh, once again, the best way you can help this podcast is to rate it on Spotify, rate it on whatever podcast platform you use, and then share it with your friends and sign up for trainer road. If you could do those three things, if everybody did that, Oh my goodness, that was listening to this. That would be huge. (laughs) That would help trainer road build out adapted training 2.0 and much, much more. We have it all planned out. We're excited to do it. Uh, so go to trainerroad.com if you want to get faster. And if you have a question for the podcast, trainerroad.com slash podcast, we'll talk to you all next week. Thanks everybody. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Bye.